Hello. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brad. What's going on? Nothing much, man. Good to finally talk to you. Yeah, hey. nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, you've been very cordial about uh, setting this up. We've been talking about it for a while, and I really appreciate you, man. I'm excited to talk to you because you do a lot of really cool stuff um, that I've been loving watching for a while now. Uh, maybe the most recently I saw you were on Kill Tony once again, which I always love your appearances on. Uh, Kill Tony is one, one of my favorite shows, and uh, you and Jamar killed it that last episode. Um, I appreciate it. That was uh, it was it was uh, it's a different show now, but uh, it's the same old Tony, and Tony's only gotten stronger. So it's it's kind of fun to see his ascension and uh, his fan base. You guys are uh, you guys are incredible. Yeah, man. Um, I uh, wanted to ask if you had any, uh, you know, any results on your attempt to get canceled on that episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. You, again, I'll say this again. Uh, you can't get canceled when uh, nobody knows who you are. So <laughs> it's good to be in the shadows. Well, do you at least yes. get some good death threats here and there? <laughs> no, I don't get any good ones. I get some weak ones. And I, I wish they would come harder and just like maybe write better you know if you're gonna tell me to you know go fuck or kill myself um you know come come edgier you know don't be boring about it you know like say you're gonna like lynch my whole family you know with like molasses and a confederate flag and then i wonder <laughs> where you got the confederate flag from because those are nowhere in stock and it's really hard to get <laughs> yeah pre pre uh supply chain issues those were those are yeah. big sellers <laughs> <laughs> supply chain of charlottesville either one <laughs> Um, I mean, that's good though. You getting death threats? That's always a good sign for, <laughs> for uh, yeah, for no right. rumors and death threats always mean that you're uh, you might be famous. <laughs> Any particularly good ones? I mean, you, I know you're saying they're pretty boring. Any standouts? Uh, what death threats or gay rumors? Which ones you going? I was going it? death threats, but you know what? Both. I'm curious. Oh man, uh, no, no good gay rumors. Um. Because I'm, I guess I'm not. Uh, and then death threats. I'm trying to think. Some guy did one time. He just said it was actually he was great. He just said you suck. I'll fucking I'll murder you and your whole family. Fuck off. And I said you don't. And then I, I corrected him because he had said he used the your and your wrong. Um, <laughs> of like the you are possessive. So then I I corrected him. And then he got he became more incensed. And then uh. I corrected him again with the same thing because he just kept doing it. And then he was like, I get it, man. He's like, it's cool. And then that was it. It was just like, he just went, he, I think he just wanted a little bit of attention. I think that's kind of what they all want. Yeah, or maybe a grammar lesson, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, grown men like teachers, I guess. There's a teacher <laughs> fetish out there. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's cool. Too bad you don't have a good gay rumor going on. I didn't even know that was a Sorry, common thing. Sorry, Brad. You know, yeah, hopefully next time, um, maybe maybe your next Rogan appearance or something, you'll have a good gay rumor moving. Maybe I'll help uh, you start it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would yeah, I would love it if it's, uh, oh, shit, if you didn't hear, like, Pete Davidson broke up with Kim Kardashian because <laughs> Ryan Moses is a side case. Spread the word! <laughs> is, he, is, is he, like, on the list for you? I mean, do you got any guys out there you got eyes for? I mean, I know you're not gay. I'm not gay, but, like, you got to admit when you see a handsome man. I mean, no, I don't have any dude crushes. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in my twenties anymore. You know, I feel like that's a, that's a for twenties thing. Like that's when you have sex with people you're not really attracted to. You're just doing it for the, for the experience. That's when you do drugs for the experience. And oh, that's when you, you know, you have 100%. like male crushes. You know. Yeah, yeah. When but, I was in college, that was the closest I was to being gay. You know. Right. I feel like a lot of yeah. <laughs> A, a, a lot of young white males in their twenties were uh, were experimenting in college. Oh yeah, with uh, with with homoeroticism. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's it's just good to hear that you're getting some death threats. Some, you know, tr it's it's this really good traction to get. Um, but you've been doing a lot of really cool stuff. I know you were telling me you had one cool gig come up last time we were going to try to have. Uh, uh, interview. Uh, do you have anything you want to say about that, or is that kind of like uh, it was what, the, We did cocaine comedy, uh, I think, while we were out in Austin. It was at uh, the Freddie Gibbs. Uh, he does a show every once in a while, like a little pop-up comedy show. And he calls it cocaine comedy, and he'll just put on uh, like comics in the area. In L.A., we did one. In uh, Austin, Texas, we did one. 
probably do one soon and on the east coast or in the midwest so uh but yeah freddie gibbs is a uh is a really talented dude um and that's kind of uh what he's doing right now just just he's doing stand-up as well as acting and also he's gonna have an album drop hopefully sometime next year that's gonna be dope so i feel like his manager right now like, <laughs> what are we talking about but that's yeah that was the thing i think we we're talking about and then i recorded an album in uh in portland oh awesome well i yeah. i cannot wait to hear it um as far as the cocaine comedy thing goes um is that was were you like on the ground floor with Freddie on that, or is that more just Freddie's thing, and you've just been a, like a consistent part of it? No, I mean like we he wanted to do it. I mean it was uh he had always said he had he had aspirations to be like a like he wanted to be like Martin Lawrence and you know in the in the Def Jam days he wanted to host yeah. a comedy show like something that was like his his own he put a stamp on uh, because he's he's just really funny on social media and he said if he wasn't a rapper he'd just be like some kind of meme lord or something like that he said in an interview and even just like you know personally knowing him he's he yeah. just loves the internet bro he is he's really good at it he's really good at being they call him a troll but he's just having fun out there now uh, w- when you see him perform is it like is he already exuding like uh great like stand-up qualities or is it is it almost like coming from the place of a rapper and it because I assume he's like I assume he can perform well, but like, where do you think he's got like a natural stand-up comedy talent, or do you think his other skill sets are lending well to it? Well, I think with stand-up, because I mean, it's it, there is an art of survival, especially when you're when you're new at it, right? Like like he is right now. Um, he's got a natural uh, charisma to him that um, that people are engaged with. You know, I think he gets that obviously from just being a performer. Um, you know, cause he's talking to the crowd in between the song, he's making fun of his DJ. Uh, it's just a lot of, um, fun happening. Right. And that's, you know, kind of stand up is, is, it's the synergy between an audience basically. And you're trying to impress upon them, um, what you think is funny. So then they'll think it's funny. Right. And he does a really good job of that. Um, but being like a polished stand up, of course, not. He's, he's brand new at it, but he's definitely got some natural chops. And if he sticks with it, I mean, yeah, he can, he can legitimately be a monster. Yeah, I mean, uh, I you know he's a really like prolific artist already, and I feel like if you can break down rap as like powerfully as he has, I feel like it gives you a skill set to attack something like that. But it has to take years, I imagine. I mean, I've I've been doing some stand up comedy open mics for about seven months now, mm-hmm. and I came from being I'm a bass player normally, and I feel like that gives me some stage comfort. But I feel like being a rapper has to give you like another layer of of uh, just being comfortable on the mic and and developing a routine. I mean, do you feel like um, I mean, for Freddie or for rappers in general, do you think of any rappers as like they're so good at writing rap punchlines that it almost like directly translates to comedy for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, I mean, Zach Fox just dropped an album. He's a stand up already. So. You've got guys like that. Uh, I mean, you think about Ludacris back in the day. I mean, all of his albums were, were very comical. Um, Gibbs has got hella punchlines. The uh, the Odd Future guys. Yeah. And, and, yeah you know, like, like, it really, I mean, it's it's all spoken word until, but theirs is just is rhythmic poetry. With stand up, it really just it is spoken word, but it, it, it's it's got, it has to have punchlines. It has to be funny, right? So um, it's kind of the same thing. They write punchlines. Uh, for emphasis, you know, for the streets or for you know whoever is a, is a hip hop fan to, I guess, become compelled by their by their writing, and I think the same thing with with stand ups want to be great writers. Like they they want to like, all right, this is this is a hell of a joke. You have to hear it, kind of a thing. It's the same thing. It, it's there's a lyrics. These are punchlines. Yeah. Um, now, how long have you been doing stand up? I know you started. I think like after you uh, moved. Man, to... fourteen years, bro. Fourteen like, years. 50- yeah, fifteen next year. Um, what do you what do you think of like the process of finding your voice as a comedian? Because I assume like you 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 have, but you're still like I, a lot of people I ask say they're still developing it. Like, what were big milestones for you in in getting to where you are now as a stand up? Uh, moving to Los Angeles, I think that's kind of what helped me. Uh, I mean, just just become more comfortable with finding my voice because. Uh, LA is so uncomfortable. Um, it's a very hard stand-up, stand-up is a hard art to conquer anyway. Um, and I started in San Diego 
and it's a it's it's a second tier market for for just you know performance art kind of a thing um not like new york or la which are the places you go and those audiences in those two places are, are very jaded just because they could they they all kind of do the same you know they we're all in the same industry kind of a thing yeah um so i would say moving just because that that kind of pushes you to you have to figure out what your voice is you can't sound like everybody else you know what i think and yeah. people were coming from like smaller cities or, or, or other markets they don't really have their voice until they're going up against the guys who are doing it for like who are professionals in these two cities doing it yeah now you obviously are a big name in in like the roasting game do you, mm-hmm. you feel like that pigeonholes you at times and do you feel like when you're approaching just your regular stand-up sets that is a big part of it or you or you almost yeah keep it I, it's it's funny you say that brad because i didn't really i don't think i understood that until recently right just because the thing's been off the air for a little bit now we still do it all the time i mean we've been doing it for eight years i've been associated with it uh, my name's been associated in programs that are you know on <laughs> that that have roasting so at this point yeah i am kind of pigeonholed in this roasting thing and i think people expect Expect me to roast, or you know, get a, cr- a crowd hyped enough to get an element of roasting in my set. And I, I just don't do that. I'm a little more. Um, I'm about the bars. I, I, I like to. I like to. I like to attempt really hard jokes. I'm not really trying to uh, make my material off the audience, unless I have to. Um, yeah. But that's just that's just another muscle you're using. But for the most part, yeah, I, I I do social commentary, and I want people to hear what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I yeah, and I. I can tell you have the diverse skill set, but I also just I, I can see how people sometimes will categorize a comic that way and, and take like they're something that has kind of blown up in its own way. But I imagine within your act, it kind of fades into the background with your other skill sets, too. Like, at one right. of your shows. Do you, I mean, do you was that was doing roasting on purpose or did it just kind of like it just kind of took on its own form while you were working on your regular stand-up act man it really it was just it came out of nowhere it was uh it was i was doing i was hosting an open mic i was running an open mic at the comedy store and uh to keep people there because i've you know i've been doing stand-up at that point what five years or something and then uh i've been to, you know you've been to all these open mics you know an open mic you know an open mic right yeah. in the five years you're like i know all the open mics especially in los angeles and they're they're tough they're hard they're boring um you know it's everybody's everybody's as as jaded as they can be so nobody wants to really be there to hear their friends do stand up because they don't care they're just trying to go on stage so my whole thing was well how do i not make this boring right how do i keep people in here and interested so i would have like guys people respect to do segments i would put them i would put names in a hat but like they would have to pull the names out of the hat themselves kind of thing so they'd have to stay in the room and listen and have to be supportive yeah. and then just one night by chance um these two people who didn't like each other, one was an employee at the comedy store at the time, and one was a brand new comic who happened to be underage that none of us knew about. He was just there. We just assumed he was he was good because we weren't, we weren't carting him. The people who were working there carted him. Uh, and he was just coming around. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this employee said, Josh Martin, he was like, he's like, hey, that kid's underage. You can't be here. And then the kid, Kenny Lyon, was like, well, I turn 21 next week, and next week I'm going to beat your ass, right? And it was, it was such a... Uh, I mean, it was like it was like a skate club, you know, the way I describe it. Because we were like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, you guys should." Sorry, you guys should come back <laughs> next week and slap box each other. Um, but the story just put in cameras, and I had just gotten this show like a month or two prior, and I was like, yeah, "We can't slap box, even though that would be dope." How about you guys come back, you know, whenever Kenny's twenty one, and uh, you guys, you know, roast each other, and then the audience will just kind of like gladiator style, yay or nay, and then one of you has to kill yourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've I've uh I've heard iterations of that story, but I, I there was details in there that were fresh to me, and it's good to hear it on air because it is such a cool yeah. uh, shift. I imagine that like for to happen in your career, um, but you know, up to that point, um, when you were developing your act, uh, was like was there an element of roasting in in the sets you were doing or was or, like because i'm sure you did no, it, but, not uh, at all yeah <laughs> i uh, mean not at all i mean the roasting guys were were benji aflalo tony hinchcliffe uh jeff danish ryan o'neill i mean david taylor Ari Shafir, like, like those yeah. guys uh whitney cummings i mean like those were 
the roastier comics, you know, like even in their acts, like they were roasting an element of something, you know, um, even especially Whitney, Whitney comes as a monster uh, back in the day. Oh, like, yeah, and, I uh, love Whitney. Her newest special yeah. is, is so amazing. Um, so it was, so yeah, so it, it literally just kind of fell on my lap just because I, I'm so into sport, you know, um, yeah. and this be, and this became, it, it became like a sport, you know. Uh, so that's kind of where I was coming from with it. I wasn't coming from like roasting, but you pick up that anyway when you're around your friends, you know, and with stand up, we're all, it's so familial, you know, it's like a sorority or fraternity in that sense. And we, we all just know each other. So it's easy to talk trash about each other, you know, because there's so many faults and flaws that we have. Clearly we're the, you know, it's the Island Misfit Toys, um, at the comedy store, especially. So it, uh, it wasn't hard to kind of like, fall into that but it was it's never been something i've been like into i mean i don't even i i've never roast battled you know like like, uh, a buddy of mine says hormones rashid he's a comic he's great he says uh yeah those who can't roast host so i just stick with that (laughs) you know what i mean yeah well yeah that's interesting i i wasn't sure exactly what your relationship was getting into but like i said either way you've become a big name in it so it's so interesting how things like that happen like the way in comedy certain things just kind of like take on a life of their own um, yeah, I'm trying not to fight it. I, I think that's what it is. I think Jeff Ross had a good thing. He told me a few years back. He was like, he used to fight it because he was writing like in the night, like in the late '90s when he was just like, he was ascending a little bit. You know, people loved him, and then he kind of fell into this roasting thing. Right? He wasn't really doing roasting material before, um, but then he just kind of fell into it because he started producing it for Comedy Central, and he was like the newest, freshest, hottest face at the in the Friars Club. Um, and I think somebody had told him, it might have been Chris Rock or somebody, and don't quote me on that, but they were like, why don't you just kind of like stick with this roasting thing? Seems like people really take to it. And Jeff was like, you know, he was younger at the time, so he was like, ah, oh, I can do anything I want. And then now it's like, this is, it's his empire. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he really, he was smart to kind of listen to that advice of, you know, maybe I do just kind of stick in this lane because nobody's really in this lane. Um, and he kind of said that to me. He's like, why don't you just kind of like stay here? And I just, I don't know if I can because... It, it's 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 a hard thing, man. People's people don't understand the scar tissue that happens to some of these people that get roasted. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's it, it's hard to see that. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I get how it's like it's only one element of getting into comedy, and and you don't want to get pigeonholed, like I said. And I I can tell there's right. like other elements to your skill set that you might not want to forego, especially when it comes to just wanting to sharpen all your tools and not not just focus on that um because because like i love that kind of stuff but like writing a good joke that's just more for the sake just, of the there's joke there's nothing but... like it yeah in this in this industry in this sport there's nothing like having a joke you wrote that you feel is original and true to you and then you get it and then you rip it and then people accept it and you're like that's what i came for not to talk trash about somebody and make them my sub you know the subject of, of my material i mean like i feel like that's i don't want to say it's cheating but it's it's it, it, it's a little easier i mean like you know you get a people can see this with when it's just you you're the director and the writer so you have to kind of pick the picture for people the picture's already there for them when you're roasting somebody yeah and it's more like temporary i feel like a lot of roast stuff is very like in the moment the night of like not really as repeatable as right. a joke um but it's also what makes it so magic too yeah you know, it's like it's like it's like a dunk contest. It's yeah. like, oh man, you remember those? Those are great. You you remember some of them? You don't, but you but you remember the the competition of it all. And you know, it's like 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 we say it's like chop sometimes because the winners are arbitrary. It's just you get to see magic happen in the kitchen. Yeah. Well, I like how you said it's like a there's like a sport element to it doing the battles. Yeah. And I like how you brought up like keeping it fresh with the mics. Like I like when a mic has an angle to it and it's it's more than just right one does five minutes and that's part of why kill tony is one of my favorite shows is because the 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 format is so it just runs itself and it's oh it's always like magical um exactly i mean to you is there is there any other formats you've seen that like make for a particularly fun show and like and are, are there any other ways you've seen comedy kind of made sport-like in that way 
Yeah, I mean, there's set list that Troy Conrad did. That thing is amazing because then it's just it's random. Oh, it's that's like, right, I have seen that. Yeah, so you've got set list out there which Troy Conrad developed, which is fun because then it's like you have these comics who you love and respect, you just guys just around the scene, and then it's you're doing this random thing, and you just have to riff on the subjects that's in this random set list. That's a, it's a hell of a show. It's just Jeremiah like a prompter, Watkins. right? Or like a screen with yeah. words come up and it's just he like also, a subject? Yeah, he has a... No, 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 that's not... The prompter's his other show. It's called Broken Prompter and it's basically just like reading uh, based on Broken Prompter segments. It's that's a really Oh, that one too. I didn't even know about. I just... I, yeah. I thought on set list they came up on a screen, the topics. They do, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, the topics okay. come up on a screen and you just kind of have to riff on them. And it's, uh, it's, always, a, it's always a fun time. Uh, that's a fun one. Stand Up on the Spot is another one that Jeremiah Watkins does. Yeah. Uh, which is basically the audience is throwing you material and then you're just and you're just riffing on it. I mean, like, yeah, it basically shows that you're riffing on. And um, I've got a new show now that I'm working on. It's called Tiny Sets. It was on the Comedy Store's IGTV for a little bit. But basically it's the same concept of a tiny desk, right? You're in a small space, or at least the camera shows that you're in a small space, like a yeah. workspace. And then there's a there's a small audience, uh, and you're basically just doing like a little concert. Um, and there's a but there's a band, right? It's like a live acoustic set you're doing. So with comedy, it's just you usually. So what we do with tiny sets is we give them like a three piece band, a piano, a bass player, uh, and drums. And then they just kind of their set conducts the music. Wait, was has Jamar Neighbors posted stuff? Yes, from that? Jamar, yeah, Jamar. Fahim, yeah. yeah oh, that I have seen Adidas. that too. Yeah, yeah. That's so like things like that where it's like you're you don't know where it's gonna go. I, I think that's always the magic of it. It's like I don't know where this is going, but this is fun, and I don't want to leave. But I think that's that's what I like about you know live comedy. Yeah. All right. Well, if you like, I want to ask if you could have the ideal venue for like roasting or just doing a stand up set or whatever whatever kind of event you want to host like what's the ideal place to do it like i'm talking cr- like non conventional like in the halls of congress north korean military parade like <laughs> like what's the craziest venue you would ever want to uh organize a show in the Louvre, bro come on cuz they don't let anybody like bring cameras in that thing you do it in there but maybe the acoustics are bad I mean that, that's just a roast battle. Wait, where, what is that place again? Because I I know the Louvre. It's like it's that, it's that famous uh, what's that like that Paris Museum or whatever. Hold on, it's fine. Because I know that sure. yeah, I know that name. I know I've heard it referenced, but I can't picture it. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like top. That's where all like the greatest art is. They say right, the Louvre. So. Yeah. If we could do like a, a stand-up show there, that'd be fucking. Or, sorry, Chase, that'd be lit. Uh, <laughs> the Louvre Museum, yeah, it's, it's the. <laughs> Got two F words here, Brad. I'm sorry. No, that's like your seventh swear, I think. Oh, is <laughs> I'm, it? Okay. I'm writing them down. Don't worry. I don't mind right. doing the editing. I, I, I'd rather you were, you know, feeling natural than feeling uh, constrained. Um, okay. But uh, all yeah. right. So yes, yeah, so the Louvre is the most visited museum in the world. So I think yeah, if you're, if I'm doing a, yeah, doing stand up in the, the most visited museum, you know, it kind of makes you a, a, an art piece yourself. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Um, now, um, not to further pigeonhole you with the roasting, I just have one more, no, one no, or two more know. things I wanted it's to ask about roasting in particular. Like, we're here, baby. Come on, um, man. Because I'm because you see it a lot, even if it's not your favorite thing to do. You 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 see it. And I feel like there's there are certain people who want to kind of try to break down what elements of it can get hard, and I feel like sometimes you see a person who is hard to roast. Like, do you? How often do you see someone and think, like, that's a hard person to roast? And what do you think is, like, a common thread between those people? Hard people to roast are usually people who don't, I mean, like, easy targets, right, are obviously race, uh, weight, height, appearance, right, Um, like, facial or otherwise. Uh, and if they don't really have those things, like, 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 white guys are hard, like just boring white guys who don't really have like a, an addiction problem or any history with their family, like abuse or like, things like that. Uh, guys who don't really, really give up those things either are tough. Uh, cause surface level roasting is boring now, right? Because everybody's been so much more specific because of all the comedy social roasts, the roast battles, uh, all the roasting style shows they've had out there at this point. Um, 
and just yeah like basic level just street jokes or, or your mama jokes are the most boring and then the hardest guys to roast i've seen through the roast battle are just like the the skinny not, not skinny but just like the average looking white male like toby morshino is probably tough to battle yes i've got a, i've got a leg up then but i also have yeah. a mohawk so i kind of look like a mass shooter right <laughs> i mean yeah mash that yeah 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 guys like yeah the the, the average or straight white male usually it's like they look like a school like an active shooter school shooter theater shooter yeah you're your, your average everyday shooter active and then uh or a child molester i mean those are usually your most popular jokes you guys get yeah for myself i use mass shooting and fentanyl usually and that gets a pop <laughs> that's like i think what i exude fentanyl's high right now brad i'm yeah. proud of you yeah um but uh okay here's a, here's another question what do you think is like a common roast etiquette that people break like do you see people kind of crossing weird lines by accident when they're trying to get into it yeah uh the lines they cross are if somebody asks them not to say something people always end up doing it i feel like they're like hey when you're not saying anything about my dead brother don't say anything about my, my father here don't say anything about my mother here yeah. um and then people always kind of uh cross that line what about with like losing the crowd Oh, that's, I mean, that hap- that's going to happen. Just like, just for being too over the top or for... Yeah, no, 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 that's, that, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of the risk you're taking. I think that's an assumed risk with the uh, losing the crowd part, but it literally is like what, what happens is uh, if somebody, like I remember like Pat Barker was going through a lot of uh, miscarriage jokes before he had his, his son. Um, and I he never said it was off limits, but I think his wife was saying it, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of battlers don't battle anymore because their significant other doesn't want to be brought up or, you know, like Doug, Doug had a dead, you know, Doug has a dead, dead figure, has a dead brother, and he would always say, like, hey, don't say this, and then people would always say something. And then he would be like, okay, well, I'm going to talk about your dead father, and then they would have a fight afterwards being like, well, you said you wouldn't say anything. He's like, I only said it because you said something. And that's, that's usually what it is. It's like when somebody asks, not to talk about a subject and that person talks about it, that's when that's that's the line you don't cross. Okay. Because it, it has to be consensual, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, all right. One last thing on roasting. Do you, what percentage do you think it is uh, a comic's ability to write and what percentage do you think it is just their delivery and their attitude in, in that setting? It's... Wow, that's a great one. I think it's fifty percent attitude, fifty percent writing, um, just from what I've seen. But I'm not a battler. Uh, I think a battler would tell you it's, it is about a lot about the writing and being confident in the writing. I mean, at that point, it is like just a performance or like stand up. And if you're not a hundred percent comfortable with what you're saying, it's gonna suck because if you're if you if you're confident in what you're saying, win or lose, if you if the crowd doesn't react to it, because that's what you're that's what you're banking on. You can stay in the moment, stay in the pocket, and that's when your attitude, and then your, then the performance shines of like, oh, everything rolls off this guy's back. But, you, but you're just confident in what you're saying. You're just like, I know that's fine. I can I can roll with anything this guy's going to say about me here. Or this person's going to say about me there. Yeah. But that's yeah. That that's I think that's the big thing. It's just nothing can you can't look hurt. <laughs> yeah. You you yeah. can't take it personally because this is a we agreed to this, so we can't take anything personally. And then just be confident in your writing, and that's really what it is. It's it's a joke writer showcase. Yeah. So you're showing people that you can really write short, succinct jokes about a subject, and if you can nail it, your performance should shine. Okay. Um, now I know that you grew up in a military family. Um, do you feel like, you know, I assume you you were you had a good sense of humor from a young age. Do you feel like with your family you had to? walk on eggshells with your sense of humor and they were very tight about those kind of things and do you feel like that gives you a good sense of like clean comedy no i think my my clean i mean they would they would love for me to be clean are you kidding me uh (laughs) (laughs) um but i mean they weren't really like they weren't non-supportive i'm not gonna say that but i'll say that they you know it's it's a tough industry to get into and there's safer ones to get into. So obviously, you know, I think any loving family would be like, Hey, take the safe route. So you're not going to be a homeless bum. We have to support you forever. Or since we can't support you, you're just going to die out there. Uh, so I didn't really have to worry about that too much. My, even my sense of humor as, as a, as a youth, I think it was fine just because, you know, it, the military towns I grew up in weren't like near big cities. They were like really 
in sticks. So it was always like me, I guess, a bunch of white people. So I think like anything that I was going to develop, my parents were going to be cool with, just because mm. I was a relatively uh, uh, decent student. Okay. Until until I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know what I mean? So I think there was a lot of leeway there for me. Okay. So they were pretty understanding of like of different types of humor and like even dark sense yeah. of humor. Yeah. And... Yeah, like, like they prefer the clean stuff, obviously, just because you know they're they're more family oriented. Um, but they get it just because they do happen to be black and they do understand what you know what plight is and they understand like you know what cursing is. And I'm not like doing like crazy dirty jokes for the sake of like doing dirty jokes or doing offensive jokes for the sake of being offensive. I think when they heard my set for the first time, they were just like, okay, we understand it, but nobody else in the family's gonna understand it or gonna want to listen to it just because of um, the content. But it's not like it, they understand there's a motive to it. And I think that's what made them feel a little more reassured about it. Yeah. Now, um, but the clean comedy that definitely came from like the clean element of being able to write a joke. Period comes from San Diego, just because all the mics around there were all music mics, and you can't just be—they're all agents, you know. So you can't just be out there cursing. So they would always make sure that uh, they were clean. So I think oh, coming okay. up in the two years I was in San Diego. Uh, a lot of the material I was writing was clean. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't, I didn't even know that. I didn't know, you, like, what, I mean, how, what percentage of your act now would you say is viable in that kind of setting? Like, do you, do you when you're writing, is it, do you feel like you kind of have to try to write clean, or is it just like 50-50 no, what's I, coming out? No, I think out? that's, that's a big problem I used to, I, I used to try to fit into, I think. It was just like, all right, I want to make sure I know where the beats of this joke are, because you want to make sure that none of your punchlines end in a curse. That's like, that's not a punchline. You know what I mean? Like that is just saying something for shock. I I feel like, um, but no, I, I mean, I, I I I that would never happen anyway. But I'm saying that uh, with with writing, with just writing jokes and writing clean, um, you're not, especially getting to the comedy store. The comedy store teaches you that it doesn't really matter. You just have to be yourself, and hopefully yourself is a funny enough person that you're going to figure it out. And then you're just being yourself. For how many ever minutes you're on stage, okay. you know, um, and, and I think with uh, so I, I I'm, I'm trying to be cognizant of what I'm writing. I'm just trying to write something that first that, that you know you think is funny that you're trying to uh, impress upon an audience to be like, hey, don't we think this is funny? And that's just where I go from. But I, I write from punchline out, not concept out. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, what what were your first sets like? Uh, and were, were you in college when you started comedy? No, so I you... I had uh, I had just dropped out, or I was I okay. think I was like at a junior college or something like that, and I was maybe thinking about like, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll transfer, you know, I'll transfer and, and I'll get my degree or whatever. But then I was serving at the Hard Rock Cafe in like La Jolla, California, and one of the servers there was a uh, was a comic. Um, and then I would just like go check him out. And basically I was just studying it for like six months. Right. Like yeah. I got all the CDs from all the greats and listen to them. And then I go to the comedy club. There's only one comedy club in town. Um, that was the comedy store in La Jolla. And I just go like watch these guys. And then I finally got the courage to do it. Um, 14 years ago. And, uh, the first set was great. The second set was great. I think it wasn't until, like the third or fourth set where like I bombed. I was like, Oh that's what people were talking about. Because then I thought I nailed it. I was just like, what are we saying? Stand up's easy. You can just do this. It's nerve wracking, but it wasn't like I wasn't like doing well. But there's no way. I mean, like I look back at any of those jokes that I would cringe. Because um, yeah. who knows that what, what I was saying or you know what, what was going on? Uh, this is like right before the black president. I think oh, this, is, this is the year Barack Obama. I think <laughs> gets it. It's nuts. Um, but yeah, that that was my first experience. Was like it was fine until. You get that first, like, oh, 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 jeez, ooh, ooh, I get it now, all right, yeah, yeah, bombs hurt, and then there's a way to bomb gracefully and, like, not take as a person when people aren't laughing at you. You have to kind of live in that silence and just embrace it, because it's subjective, they're always not going to think, you know, whatever you think is funny is funny, you have to figure out how to make your set funny, not so much take a person if they don't like a joke. Yeah, and I feel like that's just an like undeniable part of it. You know, I before I started, I was just writing ideas down for a long time, trying to wrap my head around jokes, and yeah. like I did one set, like like I did two sets before I really started, like for far apart, like like almost a year apart, and I feel like after a certain point, like knowing that the bombing is a part of it, I was just excited to bomb, 
And I, I feel like I feel like just getting that out of the way and, and just being saying like, oh, I'm done. I got that part over with. I'm moving now was like the part for me because I bombed my first two. And like I said, they were like a year apart, like like months before I really started. Um, okay. Now, when it when it came to like getting moving and just gaining that consistency, um, were there any periods where you you like took a long break, or have you been going really consistent? You know, up, like up to the pandemic, were you doing? Yeah, up to the pandemic. Yeah, there wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't a week I wasn't doing stand up. There wasn't. There wasn't three days in a row I wasn't doing stand up. I mean, I I was. Yeah. Did you? I think even especially in San Diego, I was doing a lot more. Just like I was, I was at it like at least five times a week, and then I got to LA. It's a little tougher to get spots, so you had to really hit mics and try to get shows. Uh, but I was trying to like at least maintain like three to four shows a week, um, and then a few mics to try to like you know I guess keep you know taking your medicine kind of a thing. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, that was just kind of my thing. Were you like uh, after the pandemic hit? Um, what kind of time off did you have to take and? Did you do you feel like that helped you in any ways? And like, how was the shake shaking the rust off, getting back into things? Uh, the pandemic hurt, man, because because you need a creative outlet. I think, especially yeah. as a performer, especially if you're doing this long, it's like it's an addiction. So um, the withdrawals were tough. You just yeah. couldn't do anything, and you didn't understand it. So then I was, I think a lot of like a lot of us, we were just on Twitter more, just you know trying to get our ideas out, and that's never a good idea because you know we're saying, <laughs> especially with you know the way things are, it's like people are always looking to. To, oh, look what he said, look what he said. You're just like, jeez. So the lockdown was interesting. Getting out of the lockdown was even more interesting because crowds were great, you know. They uh, they really were just happy to be outside, so no matter what you were saying. I'm going to be honest, dude, I'm, I'm bombing a lot more now than I probably ever have. Um, and it, su- it sucks. It's because I think uh, people are just really tight, and you can't, you know, like this is a very, uh, this, is a, this is a weird time because I think it's such a good time for comedy, but I think audiences as a whole are afraid and they're a little tight. Um, and it's ultimately going to make us better stand-ups just because we're going to navigate how to not, um, how to not, not how to not, but how to offend people appropriately. Yeah. I think that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like the people, like, I mean, I feel like there's a certain number of people that have gotten a different impression of being offended in recent years and i feel like mm-hmm. people are starting to learn how to be offended correctly like like just right. like getting that in comedy it's okay to be offended and i feel like for a little while it was a little more hardcore like people coming into it not expecting to be offended right right um, right right no I, I think it's it's just with the with the crowd well, i'll say crowds in in los angeles i mean just the, those are the right now i think it's um I mean, I, I mean, maybe it's just the shows I'm at, but uh, crowds are a little tight or in Los Angeles just because I think they, they, I don't know, maybe, they, maybe they, yeah, I think it's, it's what's happening with the uh, with the culture and um, people not wanting to be offended, but just being like, I don't, I, it's, that's not aging well and, and things are progressing. So yeah. again, I'll say this: it's we have to become better, and I think this is only going to be better for us because this is such a revolutionary time i think for standing there's so many subjects to talk about right like we're not just talking about the president you know we're not just talking about things that are great right now we're like you know we're there's so many bad things happening it's it's there should be a boom in stand-ups because people just want to talk and be funny about what's happening because it's it's insane what's happening out there right now yeah absolutely Um, so it's it's almost it's 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 kind of productive for people to be like, I don't want to hear your thoughts on it. It's almost like, don't say your thoughts because I'm going to get offended, and then I never want to see you again. That's the weird part to me. Yeah, again, I, th- I think it's just, I, you know, hopefully people get to a place where they're open to being offended and, and judging only on the the comic's humor, not on, like, thinking they're trying to make a point. Just realizing that that's comedy is, even if you're offended, they're just trying to work out the joke. Um, <laughs> but, you know... Um, all right, all right. One more thing on. I want to go back to your early stand-up career. Um, like, as you were getting things moving, what are some early realizations you had that kind of helped you develop your process? Early realizations to help develop my process. Um, I think it's it's ever evolving, man. Honestly, I, it's just experience and just you got to get up more. You, you you're better self sabotage. 
you're gonna do all the same things you did when you were in school you know what i mean it's uh it's really just about how disciplined you want to be uh because this is your business you know your business of performing um so it's really that and billy crystal said something good to a friend of mine who said you never want to you never want to let people see you work i never heard that until after the pan after the lockdown um and my, you know, before lockdown, then after lockdown, my buddy said, he's like, he's like, Billy Crystal said that to me. He's like, and then it reminded me of you because it's like, I'm seeing you now. And I'm like, oh, you just, I, it does look like he's working now. But mm. before, it looked like you were working, right? Kind of a thing yeah. when you'd seen me. So it's, I, I think that's, that's a good rule of thumb. But ultimately, you're going to be always working. I mean, unless you're like selling out theaters, you know? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, early on, was there anything where, like, you kind of, uh, like, you you, won't, you almost realized, like, a pattern of something you were doing that you had to, like, fix mechanically in, in, in how you were building sets? Like, I had oh, a, yeah, a comic you have tell to me. You have, to, you have to listen to your sets. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah. Um, definitely agree with that. I, I, like, I had I had one comic tell me, I, I did, like, a, I, like, I did, like, a, like, a roastish kind of thing to one of the other comics out of mic but it was too like inside jokey for the regular audience it was more played at the open micers and and one one of like the the more senior comics in the scene told me he's like don't don't do inside jokes don't do things that the crowd won't get and that was like one like rule i realized like oh i gotta sick by that is there anything like you remember like oh i was doing this wrong i was like i was playing jokes in a way that didn't necessarily like benefit my sets no, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do stand up. There's just a good and a bad. Okay. You know what I mean? Like that's that, that's why anybody can do it. I, I don't think there's like there's you got to do it this way. There, there's no baseball rules. There's no etiquette really. I mean, I've talked shit about comics. I, I, I definitely. I mean, I've I've done inside things that I know that the crowd's not going to get. But then it's it, again, you're doing a set. You're doing a symphony. Like you're playing. You're playing an act. You know, you're you're playing. A, you're playing a, a fucking guitar set. You know, so it's. It's not about how you start. It's just kind of get him on your side. Like Carlin Williams used to do this thing where he would just purposefully bomb for like eight minutes, and then he'd get him back in the last ten or last five or however long his set was, just to just to get his rocks off, kind of yeah. a thing, just because he knew he could. So it's it, I don't think there's a right or wrong. Like you can do anything you want. That's that's the beauty of it. Um, it's just yeah, it's just it's just good or bad. Okay. Yeah, man. Well, um, I do really appreciate all this like insight, and I'm sure a lot of listeners will too. You know, um, you know, hopefully advertise this to some different uh, comedian groups I know, and it's it's all really informative stuff. That it's it's great to hear from someone as uh, prolific as you. Um, but I do also want to touch on music a little bit more because Sick. I love to you know when I have I have mostly have musicians on, and I love to ask them what what they're into comedy wise but when i have comedians on i love to see what what influences them musically i mean do you off the top of your head do you have any particular favorite music yeah uh you know i'm, I'm big into uh instrumental music um just because i played an instrument as a kid and i was always real big into it uh what instrument i played saxophone trombone um nice trombone was my first yeah, yeah, just because it's so it was so easy, um, and nobody else wanted to play it, so I was just like, well, "I'll be first sharing this." Oh, uh, I, I sucked at it. Um, <laughs> I was a yeah. bad trombone player. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's fine. I mean, it's it's fine. It's no, it's, it's cool, instrument. Brian. You're just better at trombone than me. Whatever, dude. No, no. I mean, listen, that was, that was junior high school. Come on. First, first uh, chair, no problem. School. <laughs> yeah, not, nobody else is trying to do it. That's what I'm saying. Like everybody was like playing all the cool instruments, like the drums or the trumpet or the you know all the. Yeah. Well, the girls play flute and clarinet, and nobody wanted to play like a you know a stand up bass or a tuba. So I was like, I'll just take the trombone because nobody else is messing with this. Yeah, uh, but go, uh, go but on. I, I like, thing. yeah, I like. I mean, you know what I like? I like you know the L. Michaels Fair, and I like Af- like you know, some Afrobeat stuff. Like that that Dab Tone uh, label is what I really like. The, you know, the Dab Kings and Sharon Joneses, and rest in peace, Sharon Jones. And, uh, you know, I like Bad Bad Not Good. I like oh, I like yeah. Tyler stuff. I like Taylor Swift too. I mean, I like it all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you really again for putting me on to L. Michaels affair. That that stuff is very cool. I did not they, know they about that. They jam. Yeah, yeah, they really jam. 
Uh, but I like I like the Griselda guys. I mean, if we're talking, you know, hip hop. Yeah. Uh, I love MF Doom. I mean, that's that's rest who. In peace. That's who. Yeah, rest in peace. That's that's you know that's my biggest influence. Um, yeah, he's the one who got me into hip hop. Like listening to One Beer by MF Doom was like the, uh, the first song. I was like, I need to hear that again. Dude, <laughs> One Beer blows my mind. I like when the. Uh, Odd Future did like one of their first, like the Odd Future tape. They uh, they kind of remixed it a little bit and, and did it. I forget what they called it, but it had the same one beer beat. And I was just like, this beat is so good. Yeah. He's, that... I mean, but obviously, you know, Dumoulin is like the best over it. So. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess like Taylor Swift is one of the poppiest things I, I would have, uh, you know, gotten out of that list of artists but is there any other like nuts dude is well is there any other like uh musical like influence on you that people wouldn't guess or like like early on your life like one of the first things you heard musically that has like had a profound effect on you even if it's not like your favorite easy you know man i grew up in like the high desert and like like like, weird farmlands in california because i was a you know i was a military kid uh so you know i grew up around a lot of white people and, and a lot of um rural white places in, in the new metal era. So, I mean, yeah, dude, I was listening to Limp Bizkit. I was listening to oh, the okay. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to Kid Rock, you know, but I was also listening to Wu-Tang. I was also listening to Biggie. I was also listening to, you know, yeah. all the guys, Mob Deep and those cats. So, uh, the Nazis. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's an eclectic taste, but I think I really, I gravitate towards, I think the older I get, just instrumental stuff that I can just chill, lay back, and just kind of, like, put my own thoughts to. yeah. Cool, man. Well, uh, it's very interesting to hear. I always love asking that, like I said, to com- comedians or musicians. I feel like I get a different answer every time. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's nice to hear where people are coming from. Um, and again, it's just nice to hear so much about the art of comedy from someone so experienced because I love comedy so much. So I can't thank you enough for coming uh, on dude, the I, show. We could talk this all day, Brad. Thank oh, you for I know. Coming, man. I could keep I appreciate going. You. If you ever have anything else to promote, you're always welcome back. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope to catch one of your shows sometime soon. But uh, yeah, what should Check people... out the Rose Battle. We do it every Tuesday on Instagram Live. Of course. Uh, 10.30 Pacific. So that'd be 1.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern. So, yeah, 1.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning, I guess, for you guys. But, uh, yeah, we, we do a Rose Battle every Tuesday at the Comedy Store, and then we broadcast it on Instagram Live at Rose Battle. Uh, awesome. Is there anything else that the audience should be keeping out for and any place online they should be looking for you? Yeah, just, you know, Brian Muzzles for Breakfast, Instagram, um, at Race Banning on Twitter, Race, R-A-C-E-B-A-N-N-I-N-G on Twitter. So, yeah, just look out for anything I'm doing. I'll, I'll post it there. Uh, and I got a podcast coming out soon. I'll post it there, and you guys will know about it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. It's been a pleasure, and uh, hope you have a good day. Brad. Brad, I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, man.